um, Muslim pilgrims because we felt very much that um, Hajj is a very, very British story and we had to represent that in the, in the exhibition. So he's going, to, um, he's going to talk to us about organising Hajj going from Britain. Thank you.
um, flag and the full complement of work that's gone on in terms of the British Museum's um, emphasis on uh, British Muslim hash stories. There's a website there where um, various stories have been collected. Um, and if you've been on hash, you can go there and uh, talk about or write about your, um, your, your most uh, amazing experience. Um, that's just a quick look at what the survey looks like. Um, it's just a snapshot. Um, things that we're asking about, for instance, um, uh, did you make a will before you went for Hajj? Uh, about 30% of people made a will. Um, did you settle any debts uh, rather more? Uh, about 60% of people um, settled debts and all sorts of interesting questions arise. Um, what sort of debts would you settle? Would you settle all of your debts or, or some of your debts? And, um, but just in terms of those sorts of questions, um, at the top of the tree was uh, uh, people, um, did you go and seek forgiveness uh, before departing for Hajj? Um, about 84, 85 percent of the people um, did that. So the, the, the survey um, asked about 60 questions, many of which um, covered the different aspects of preparing for Hajj, being in Makkah Medina, and uh, returning. Um, so. Um, that was really just to give you a, a quick um, sense of um, what we were doing in that regard. So, uh, to the presentation in hand. Um, I really want to just, I suppose, begin to track, to map, um, to build up some sort of anatomy of the way HAD is organised in the UK. Uh, and although I'm, I'm at this point really relying on uh, just uh, a few interviews, a picture's beginning to emerge, and as I say, um, I want to do more research, but um, I think the research that's been done so far does um, begin to raise some interesting um, questions. Um, so the pilgrims experience themselves, how they plan, key issues for them, um, the tour operators, um, the issues for those, um, uh, constituencies, um, the emergence of pilgrim welfare organisations in the UK. I uh, mentioned the Council of British Hajis, um, also the Association of British uh, Hujaj, um, and then finally the, the government involvement itself, uh, whether it's in terms of the delegation that went um, throughout most of the decade of the noughties, um, and also work that's been done in terms of trading standards. Um, so, uh, those are the four aspects that I want to say just a few words about. Um, I think inevitably I'm going to run out of time, uh, but uh, here goes. Okay, so just um, a few uh, general contextual points really in terms of the changing way in which um, I suppose deciding to go for hand or the decision making processes around um, Hajj going and preparing for Hajj going has been transformed in late modernity for um, pilgrims. Um, I think the key point really, and this was something born out in the um, survey, was that um, British Muslims now absolutely have an expectation that they will go for Hajj. And if we're looking at that South Asian connection, um, despite what we're hearing about pauper Hajjis um, this morning, um, certainly, um, I would say that um, really that's been a rapid um, transformation over probably two or three generations. Um, so it's quite interesting to see that 80% of all the people who completed the survey, their parents have been had, but it was a much smaller number for um, their grandparents. So there's something about um, the onward march of late modernity, there's something about migration which brings prosperity. Um, that has seen a, a change um, there. Um, Hajj is a religious duty, of course, um, but again, the survey was revealing some interesting um, themes in terms of um, the personal inflection of, of our need. Um, so the spiritual journey of the self, um, traveling to religious spaces from diaspora spaces um, to, in a sense, clear one's head to, to get some spiritual sustenance, and that accounted for nearly a third of the most important reason for travelling for Hajj. Um, all sorts of um, constraints. Um, yes, it's an invitation from God, but uh, uh, all sorts of constraints on why people might choose a particular moment to go. 
um, the financial, the family, work constraints. Uh, one of the people we interviewed was a university uh, professor, and he, he waited until um, uh, Hajj fell in the Christmas uh, vacation. Um, I suppose the final issue, and I think it's a very interesting one, is the way in which um, Hajj has been uh, demythologized um, in late modernity, the way in which um, the possibility to, to gaze uh, from a distance at Mecca um, Medina to uh, get that sense of what's going on, what it looks like, and so on and so forth, um, through the mass media, through guidebooks and so on, um, you can see so many media emerging where you can uh, where you can actually view the rituals, where you can uh, get box pops with um, individuals. Uh, and I'm interested in the extent to which that really transforms uh, or, or reconfigures the way in which um, pilgrims might think about the holy places. I think what's interesting is that for all the overproduction of information, um, for different um, groups of pilgrims, there are um, genuinely different experiences. So for some groups that may be um, in a sense, um, have different sorts of social capital, um, maybe still um, struggling with literacy and so on and so forth. Satellite television can be a revelation, but in terms of actually performing the rituals, um, learning the prayers and so on and so forth, um, there can be all sorts of anxieties and challenges there. Um, just uh, a quick um, sort of dip down, as it were, from the, the big picture to the smaller picture. Um, we interviewed a lot of women. Actually, the last time I gave a talk, I thought, oh, great, now I've got all these lovely pictures of um, pilgrims. Um, somebody came up to me um, just a couple of weeks ago here at the British Museum and said, well, you know, none of your women, or all of your women, are actually um, veil wearers. Uh, and that's a good point, and um, it's another reason why perhaps um, I'd like to sort of press on further with this um, research. But I just wanted to focus on one British Muslim woman's experience. I haven't put her picture there because I didn't really want to put her in the frame. Um, but uh, she was interviewed, very interesting, just a few days before she went for Hatch. So most of the people I interviewed, I'd interviewed and they'd been for Hatch. But here was somebody who, in just a few days' time, was going for Hatch. It was really interesting to talk to her about the sorts of issues that were on. Uh, her mind. She was a school teacher going for a four or five star package, paying about £4,000. Um, probably quite a pious person, I would say. Um, and I think, again, it, it really um, suggests to us the way in which this great ritual, which has all of that continuity with history, is inflected in very particular ways through uh, personal life stories, personal um, experience. So, just a few um, quotations there. I won't um, dwell on these, um, but um, let me just pick one or two out there. I think they sort of reflect, uh, in a funny way, the sort of late modern condition. So, um, here's one. So, even though myself and my husband are going together, we've been preparing separately. So, the sort of idea of an individual self, particularly from a gender perspective, rather interesting, but we do share a lot. Um, we'd sit in bed at night, he'd have read something, I would have read something. So that whole kind of space of the couple, uh, very interesting indeed. Um, perhaps another one to pick out, um, which I thought was uh, rather interesting, um, this whole sense of a, a responsibility to the community of, of, of the Hajji. Um, I've been keeping a diary and recording everybody if they ask me to make a dua, to make a supplicatory prayer on uh, my behalf. And while she says that um, there were certain duas that absolutely had to be said in Arabic, uh, in terms of the interpretations that she'd been exposed to, she wasn't going to stress herself about trying to recite um, all of her duas in Arabic. So it's quite sort of engaged, sort of critical reflection on um, Muslim 